Officials at the Vacaville Medical Facility allowed the press to speak to Black Panther Party founder Huey P. Newton Wednesday and Thursday of this week for the first time since his recent trial. KPFA was told Huey would be allowed to visit with the press from 1 to 3 p.m. on Thursday, and we arrived at 1 precisely. Entering the facility, which is a cop-out word like device as a nuclear device, entering the prison meant showing press identification, signing in, getting my wrist invisibly stamped, waiting for a series of steel gates to slide open with, with no two ever opening it at the same time, showing more identification, signing more slips of paper, going through more steel doors, until I was in the prisoner's area where I didn't know what to do with my eyes and they didn't know what to do with my beard. I was finally led to a small office to wait for Huey Newton, who I was told was with his psychologist, a Dr. Sorensen. A short while later, two other members of the press arrived, Joe Blum, who's the editor of the movement, and Karen Wald of both the movement and the Guardian. We waited and waited until 2.30, meanwhile making several somewhat half-hearted attempts to point out the time to various officials, one of whom politely informed us that Mr. Sorensen's work was just as important as ours. Of course, for us, there was no possibility of returning tomorrow, but it is difficult to bring oneself to argue with the establishment when locked up in it. Before using a phone to contact the official who had arranged for us to see Huey, we were warned to dial quickly because any phone left off the hook for longer than 10 seconds would set off an alarm. At 2.30, Huey was brought to our tiny office and we began to talk. The first voice you hear is that of Huey P. Newton. Yeah, I've been reading uh, prompts with half about three of them. Um man for himself and uh, just finished reading um, Beyond the Chains of Illusion by Fromm and uh, I read Dash's book and um, You got to read all three volumes of Dr. Trump? No, they, no, they didn't have all three volumes, they just had one book but uh, it was pretty good to call the Iron Prophet Well there are three of them, the, the Prophet Arm, the Prophet, the prophet Arm he, and the prophet he mentioned it. He mentioned it, but then there's only the one. The oh, prophet because it goes on for, for a thousand <coughs> pages more after that. Yeah. Yeah, right. I was surprised it's in this library right now, you know. After this brief discussion with Joe Blum, Huey began poring over the various issues of both the under and above ground press brought in by Joe and Karen. One contained a picture of Huey taken Wednesday, his head practically shaved. I'm glad they had that picture. It made it not such a shock. What? I said, I'm glad that they had that picture because then it wasn't such a shock. Because <laughs> <laughs> even Alex said that you, that you had your hair cut all, all off short. No, but, he, uh, he was completely bald. He can't last, I think. Yeah. Is it mandatory to be that short? No, you see, the guys gave me a real bad haircut when I came in. So I just cut it all off because it left patches, you know. Mm. You have to get it cut real short. Mm. So I just cut it all off so it'll be even when it grows back, you know. Did you cut it yourself? Oh, no, no, we have a barber and an inmate. Do they allow mustaches? No, nothing. Has the press been reasonably fair? In its reports, you said that they hacked up two and a half hours of interview in one minute. Uh, but th th this was uh, the new the uh, TV the the, the uh, news on the on the uh, yeah, yeah. TV six o'clock news. They never put very much, you know. So, but this was uh, very bad because um, what did they play? They they only played up uh, one question. I was asked how did I feel about Officer uh, Frey, and. Um, I explained that whenever anyone is killed or hurt, that I feel sympathy and uh, great compassion uh, for them. And uh, I went on to explain that uh, I had no responsibility for it because I was innocent. And uh, but still, that that uh, the Panthers uh, are against uh, killing and against all wars. As a matter of fact, I explained our motto: that we're advocates of the abolition of war. But they didn't explain this. They just said that I felt uh, uh, remorseful about it. That this is all they played, you see. And then it could be interpreted well. I'm copying out and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that. You know? I guess that uh, 
it you know goes without saying what your reaction to the trial was, but I'm really very curious uh, about how specifically, you know, on what specific things did you react negatively to about the trial? I mean, obviously you felt that it was unjust and that everything went in you know, the wrong way. <clears throat> what points, you know, do you point to and say there's there's one of them? Well, one, that uh, blacks were systematically ex excluded, and we had uh, uh, much evidence on this, including the fact that the Public Defender's Department reported to the attorneys, uh, to, uh, to Gary, that um, it had been their experience whenever black was tried that uh, there wouldn't be any more than one or two blacks on the jury. But in the other courtrooms uh, where blacks were the defendants, you, uh, there were four and five uh, blacks on the jury. And uh, the public defenders felt that they, the DA had ordered his department not to uh, dismiss any blacks off the jury on a preemptory challenge so that they wouldn't be a part of my panel. Uh, this wasn't... Uh, presented because the Public Defender's Department refused to testify to this even though they had given the information to my attorney. Uh, so this is one instance of uh, an injustice. Uh, the district attorney didn't want to be embarrassed by having to uh, challenge even more blacks than 26, which he did challenge. He left one on the jury. So this is one instance. The, the other thing is how the uh, uh, Jensen attempted to erase the tape recording. Uh, this was the change of uh, where uh, Greer, the bus driver, who's a star witness for the prosecution, stated that he didn't uh, see the defendant, or who was allegedly the defendant, uh, clearly because he only had his lights on. And uh, at the trial, he said that he did see him clear because he had his lights on. And uh, we've got the tape two days after the jury was out. Uh, the tape was listened to the night before it was presented in court. And it was very clear on the tape, it was in the possession of the DA, that uh, he, he said that uh, he, didn't, he didn't see the... Uh, a person uh, clearly, but the DA, one was listened to in court, the DA apparently had erased that part that the judge couldn't even hear it, and it was lucky that we had transcribed uh, the tape to another tape recorder and uh, played it, else I would have been lost completely if we hadn't done that. So this was just treachery by the uh, uh, district attorney's department. So that's uh, another instance. I presume that <coughs> all of these points will be used uh, in attempts to get retrials, but it does look as if, uh, according to Mr. Gary, that you will probably be here at least 18 months before yeah. anything comes of that. Maybe even longer, actually. Except that he should be out now on bail. Yeah, right. But they won't give me bail. That's another uh, discriminatory practice that they're using that uh, manslaughter, that uh, you're eligible for bail, but it's in the discretion of the court after conviction. And uh, they wouldn't give uh, bail to me in spite of the fact that the community that they wanted to protect uh, sent in about uh, 29,000 uh, signatures asking for my release on bail. The judge uh, showed that he was a good uh, bureaucratic uh, capitalist and uh, the reason I say that is because uh, he uh, wouldn't give this control to the people that uh, he was going to control it like he saw fit and uh, in conformity to the, mach the, the political machine's uh, desire and uh, I wasn't released on bail. As out of this. After the trial, uh, you were taken immediately, or brought immediately to Vacaville. Uh, I couldn't believe when, when a newsman, uh, as I was standing in the crowd outside the Alameda County Courthouse just after the trial was over, but a newsman was really accurate when he said he'd seen you go by in a station wagon. 
and that right. you raised your fist. I, I couldn't believe that that, that the, the security of, of the whole setup, since it had been so tied up till then, would have allowed them to actually drive you directly by the group that was waiting outside. That's exactly what happened, though. Is that is that right? About six cars. And there was just one station wagon. No, you were there. Were, there were there were six oh, cars. I see. I see. You just didn't see it. Uh, I had a six-car escort, uh, two back of it, all the way down. But they, you were taken out of the courtroom and put in the station wagon. It must have been like that. And brought directly here. That's right. I, I didn't even return to my cell. I went directly down. Matter of fact, they were so uh, anxious to get me out, they packed about five of someone else's suits into the <laughs> boxes. And uh, I don't know if they got them back to the guy or not. I recognized the clothing. I told them uh, who they belonged to. To whom they belonged to. Yeah. What do you think of the discretion of the um, court in granting bail to the pick to the cop that uh, San Francisco cop that murdered um, the the black guy in San Francisco? Do you know that they gave him bail? Yeah, they gave him bail, but then they reversed that. Because no, they gave him it to him again today. Twenty-five thousand dollar bail. It's because now. the cops uh, oh, resigned. The two two hundred cops resigned from the. Uh, no. This was rumored. They didn't oh, they were, do it. They've been playing that rumor up to that they're going to go to the highway patrol to the hundred and whatever court. Oh, is that right? Well, they first let this guy out on OR, and then they put him back in. And yeah. They didn't even ask for that. Twenty-five $25,000 bail. Yeah. That's, mat that's uh, material for the uh, community to explode. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what, what's, it, what's it been like here? Uh, has it been a, as bad as far as your being hassled is concerned as, as Alameda County was, or... You know, has there been any improvement? Uh, have you been given a hard time? Well, as far as the physical conditions, uh, it's an improvement because I, I can have the privilege to exercise, to go to the library. Uh, as far as attitude, uh, it's still a very hostile attitude, and every day I have some altercation, or, or, uh, or uh, the police are reprimanding me for some petty thing and actually making a big scene out of it, uh, attempting to provoke me. But uh, I've submitted to the intimidation uh, thus far because I realized that they would like to provoke me into uh, um, an incident of some kind. The prisons are very concerned about it. They've noticed that uh, each day there's <coughs> Excuse me, there, there's, there's some other sort of minor... What kind of uh, things? Uh, well, it's really, it's really not anything very serious. I'll give you an example. Uh, yesterday, um, no, this was Saturday, this particular thing. Um, I'm supposed to leave my um, uh, unit at uh, 7.30, I have a car to go to X Court at 7.30, and uh, this, uh, you have a car to go different parts of the jail different times. Uh, this cop uh, told all over the speaker everyone to lock up, and um, I didn't lock up because I had gone before at 7.30, I have an early uh, appointment, and uh, after every, well, after everyone locked up, and he called me out and uh, said, "Well, everyone locked up, but the wing workers, they're guys who uh, keep the wing straight." And he called me out, and the police called me out then and said, "Why, why haven't you? Uh, why didn't you uh, come to my desk?" I said, "Well, I didn't hear you call me." He says, "Well, I told everyone to lock up, and you didn't lock up, and I called you by name." Well, it's difficult for me to understand the speakers. I don't know whether they call me or not, but I hear the noise, but it's scrambled, you know, over the uh, speakers. So um, I said, but um, he says, well, whenever I call you, you're supposed to come, you know, and he's, 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 uh, he's saying it in a very hostile, very belligerent way, uh, pointing his finger and so forth. And uh, so I said that whenever I, uh, if I had heard him, I would have responded. And that, what did he want me to do? Did he want me to lock up? I showed him my work card, and uh, he continued to make an issue out of while the other inmates watch, you know, because the inmates are watching and see, well, what am I going to do about this, you say? <coughs> 
So then he said, well, I'm going to go in the room and you get on the speaker and call me. I'll see if I can hear it. So he went into the room and uh, so I went up to the speaker and pretended I pressed the button, and but I didn't. And then he, he stayed in there for a while. He ran out. He's, he's very upset. Very and I said, as he came out, I said, well, did you hear me? And uh, he didn't say anything, you know. He said, you go in there and uh, see if I can hear you. And all the time, the inmates were watching, you know, a big scene. So then I walk in, and uh, he calls my name, and I step out, and I said, well, you did much better that time. And then he said, well, whenever I call you, I want you to come. So I said, I will respond if I hear you. And every day is something like this, you say, or something in the mess hall where I missed a seat, maybe. And uh, this is a big earth-shaking issue, you say. You're supposed to fill each table up. If you overlook a table, you're subject to go to the hole. You know, as far as, you know, as far as the way they talk to you, I didn't go to the hole about it, but uh, I was reprimanded. Have you been in the hole Well, when I first came, I was put in the hole, but I was treated uh, like an inmate on the main line. I could still come out of my cell, but I was in the side where the guys don't come out. I was the only one to come out, and sometimes they would forget to feed me, but I would miss breakfast, but they would feed me after when they finally discovered that I was supposed to come out, you see, because they wouldn't. They'd bring the food up to the other guys who never leave something like at the county where they bring everything to you because the guys are in there all day. But uh, I was always on the main line, but for a few days I was uh, kept on the whole side. But now I'm out. I'm on the uh, regular uh, main line. I live in a, um, a unit where all the guys are out. Mm -hmm. Or individual cells? Individual cells. Are you working? Yeah, I have a, uh, I'm supposed to be a janitor in X corridor, but uh, so far that I've been able to um, to uh, evade the work. <laughs> no, there's really nothing that you have to do. It's just more or less everyone's supposed to be assigned to a, to a um, you know a particular place. The, the first time, the reason I really got the job was uh, so that I could be out of my cell more. I had been locked up for a year, and I need the exercise, you know. And uh, you get out of your cell more. You don't have to lock up when the other guys lock up. But I haven't have to, I, uh, so far I can go in side of X Court and there are uh, many empty rooms and I can go in and read. So I'll get my library books and go in there and, uh, and read uh, practically all day when I'm out in the gym or outside on the yard. Uh, if It's kind of a, really it's an advantage because um, the library only stays open two hours, and uh, there aren't too many places you can go. You can go to the gym, the yard, or the library, and uh, the library is only open two hours, so if you go to the gym, there's so much noise you can't read, or out in the yard, you can't take any library books. So I can always go to, to the ex corridor rooms, and uh, the vacant rooms that are not being used for counseling. And uh, it's a pretty good deal. But I, I've been going, I work out every morning at the, uh, at the gym. It's pretty good. What, uh, <clears throat> when we arrived, you were in with uh, the psychologist, Dr. Sorensen, I believe his name yeah. was. Now, how often does this happen? It's the first you? day. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, what, what, what's, what's that like? Uh, uh, well, it was just a conversation today that he tried to get off into the case, and I told him mm -hmm. that we couldn't really intelligently discuss it uh, because uh, we would be very contrary. The first, his first question was, well, uh, uh, how do you control your emotions under stress? And uh, I said that I had no problem whatsoever. And he said, well, you are here. And I said, yes, I'm here. And we probably can't discuss this because uh, I'll, be ta I'll talk about one thing, you're talking about another because you're assuming because I'm here that, I was, uh, that I'm guilty. And uh, I'm not guilty, so uh, I'll, uh, I can't, we can't relate to each other in any sort of significant way. So he understood and dropped that, so then we just talked about social issues and uh, talked about the prison here. So uh, it was a pretty good discussion. What would you be saying once a week or something like that? That's the way it works out. Is it mandatory and then all the rest of it? Um, 
I don't know. They have a, um, the only thing that's mandatory so far is the, uh, maybe this is mandatory too because if you don't answer your ducking, then uh, it's cause for uh, disciplinary action against you. So I just received a slip to go to his office. and um, But I go to an orientation twice a week and there's a, a, soci a sociologist or maybe a psychologist in there. And um, it's a group discussion. And it's pretty interesting. The inmates say a lot of things that are interesting. A lot of their attitudes are pretty out of sight, too. Like about what? Well, about the whole um, penal institution, about society in general. You get guys that are almost totally destroyed, you know. And it's not really funny, like funny, funny. But uh, it's interesting. and the way that the counselor tries to uh, uh, relate to him, and he's talking as insane as the guy is practically, um, because his whole therapy seems to be, uh, if it's supposed to be therapy, I don't know what it's supposed to be, but um, he's telling the guy that he should get a job and you know work at something and not, and he can't see the guy's real problem is that uh, many of the inmates that uh, they have no real purpose, you know. That is very, they talk about taking the time up when they get on parole, you know, you're just fooling around, you were going to these night spots. And uh, you, if you had been on this job, then everything would have been all right. So this seems to be the counselor, this is what he says anyway, his attitude uh, to make yourself uh, useful, you see. And uh, he doesn't see this is all very empty to this inmate because uh, he's trying to uh, feel the the emptiness of his whole life. This one particular guy was saying um, um, <clears throat> how the uh, adult authority and everyone was down on him and the guy gets on the street and he can't get a job and uh, the adult authority is working this all the time so to make sure he can't get this job and he comes back here and then they won't let him out and uh, that he didn't do anything but go over to the topless uh, uh, clubs <laughs> often and the cops says, uh, uh, all you want people to do is give you, give you, give you things uh, uh, and if you don't, if they don't give it to you then uh, you'll take it and uh, and he doesn't, the counselor doesn't understand this is the whole system that uh, the guys are pretty well adjusted really uh, the guys in here because they understood that uh, if, they, if no one would give it to them, they're going to take things, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and if the, uh, the whole human factor is never discussed, so far it hasn't been, on uh, a matter of purpose and showing the, the decadence of the society. Of course, the counselor won't, uh, won't uh, if he mentions this, he will mention it in sort of a passing way that there's certain things wrong with the social structure, but basically he views the inmates as being uh, um, not very well adjusted. When they are extremely well uh, adjusted, those that I've uh, seen in the group. So uh, he seems to be missing the mark. Are you straightening the mouse on? Uh, so yeah. far, so far. Today was the first day that I talked a little because the counselor talked to me. Mostly I was listening to the inmates, you know, to sort of sort of see where they were, were standing and uh, most of them seem to be pretty uh, unenlightened or uh, they're not very conscious as far as the uh, as far as being cognizant of the political and social ills. They know the substance is wrong and they know that they're not fitting in the game. But uh, um, they can't really see, uh, it's still sort of unconscious, these things that are controlling them, they haven't unveiled it, you know, so, uh, some of them even protect, you know, maybe they're doing it to front for the council, but they'll try to protect the system, say, so, well, you know you were doing it wrong, you know, and there's this whole thing, uh, boils around to following the law, abiding by the law doing wrong or doing right 
as uh, related to the law, and they discuss nothing, you know, about you know about the purpose or uh, purpose in life. You, know? you said earlier you alluded to the fact that that you were being watched by the other inmates when you, when you, when you made certain moves. What has been the reaction of, of, of others? other inmates to you uh, since you arrived in Vacaville. I mean, the reaction of the administration probably, you know, is a clear and understandable, but has there been a mixed reaction? Have you been well received? Or, or, I mean, what does that I, mean? I think, uh, I've been well received, very friendly. The inmates are friendly, even those I don't know, they walk up and they talk to me. Um, I think they expected me to organize something as soon as I got here, but, uh, of course, I haven't because uh, first I have to get uh, adjusted to the situation, or at least understand the dynamics that are working here more than adjusted. And um, the second thing is to figure out some things that we can do. But I think they were they were expecting a uh, a uh, for me to respond to the. Uh, to the bulls in a, uh, a uh, belligerent fashion, in, uh, or because they've uh, they've uh, directed their hostilities at me, and the inmates have said, you know, that they're just focused on you, you know, because they, some of the police have asked the inmates, well, which one is Newton, you know, they work, and uh, most most of them do that. Matter of fact, even people come in here touring, they want to know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so the inmates tell me you know, that they heard the last soon the fools. Where am I located? How, you're scheduled to stay here 90 days, huh? Oh, uh, 60 days. 60 days? Right. And have you any indication where you're going? No, not really. Why are you I, I think they'll send me down to see him, what, see him east down at. St. Louis yeah. Episcopal. I guess it's the farthest away that they can send you. Probably. What kind of, what is that, me, medium security? I think so. Why, why were you brought here for 60 days? Is that normal procedure? Yeah, this, everybody yeah this is the medical facilities where they run a battery of tests on you to, uh, to, so they can know what kind of person you are and so forth. But so far I, fi I file them up on a test. So. How'd you do that? Well, <clears throat> like half, I don't know, it's, it's mostly how I feel. Uh, um, some of the tests I read and I would get hung up on, you know. Like one thing they had on history, and they talked about the railroads, so when the railroads came in. And, and I'd get hung up on it then just by accident, and I'd start uh, concentrating on answering the questions correctly. But then about half or two-thirds of the test, that uh, it's very, uh, it's not interesting to me. So I just go through it and just make black marks on the paper, you know, for the IBM sheets. <laughs> so the half of the test, you know, I was doing really well. Then the other half, I, I got zero. And uh, then they, matter of fact, they, uh, because I did most, in some of the tests, I just went through it and got zero on the whole test because I just, a three-hour test, I would do it in three minutes and you know, walk out of the room. So, <laughs> so uh, because um, number one, that I can't see where it would be any, any advantage to me uh, to uh, reveal myself to them in any kind of way. So, um, but the only times when I make a mistake, the test is interesting. I'll, <laughs> I'll start asking. <laughs> they call me in to take a retest on, on. Um, on one of the exams. What, what, and kind of, what kind of tests are there? Are oh, they're, they're just, uh, uh, most of them are aptitude tests, likes and dislikes, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, those, those, those sort of tests. But uh, then they had this one section on, uh, this one section of the test I liked on history. That was, that was the part I got hung up on. And uh, then you would do another part with uh, general intelligence or aptitude again with the symbols of how many boxes like this or how many uh, uh, how many circles are in the box or <coughs> stuff, stuff like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. I uh, 
We're gonna have to change tapes here in a minute. Yeah, oh, they, they told they retest me and they said that this time the counselor the inmates give the test. And so, uh, this time the counselor uh, was gonna observe me to do uh, doing this test. So they gave me another test, and uh, it was a half hour test. And I finished that in a minute. And I started to walk out of the counselor said, uh, Newton, come back. So I, I went back and he said, uh, you could do a decent job on this test in a minute. And that's, and, uh, no, no. First he said that uh, you can finish this test in a minute. I said, well, I did, you see. So the test was finished. So well, you can do a decent job on this test in, in one minute. I, I said that, uh, am I required to do a decent job? And so he blew it. He said, no, no, you're not required to do a decent job. Neither are we. We're not required to do a decent job either. And I said, well, that's between you and your superior, whether you do a decent job or not. I'm not interested, you know. So that's pretty fun. So now they've got you down for low incentive. I don't know. Who knows what that does? <laughs> Good heart. I just talked to the psychologist. He had all my tests there. And he said that, uh, he said my tests were puzzling. I didn't explain anything to him. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said that, uh, um, we don't, we don't know, um, we still don't know anything about you, or, or we don't know, um, we don't know whether the test is valid or, or, or what it reflects, you know. And I said, so I said, well, do you have to know, you know, what the, uh, he said, well, this is just our hang up, you know, these tests. I said, well, you know, I'm not hung up on tests. And <laughs> so, it was a pretty good thing. I gotta change tape. Okay. I'll jump back in with both feet. Um, I guess this is probably the most serious question I had in mind to ask you when I came in today, and so I'll approach it that way. Uh, what do you think the effect is going to be on the Black Panther Party you know, if you and Eldridge and Bobby all end up in jail? How do you think? it might change the party? How do you think it might change the movement? Because they, you know, you, you are the three most outstanding spokesmen at the moment. I think that uh, David, uh, Hillary, and Hilliard, Hilliard, and uh, George Murray and Kathleen will have a, a big job on their hands, but I think they'll, they'll be able to handle it. And, uh, um, Bill Brandt uh, is a very fine worker, and Wade, um, and uh, some other uh, Panthers who've been taking a leading role. I think that uh, the work will uh, their work will just increase, but I'm sure they'll be able to handle the uh, leadership of the Panther in the event that uh, Eldridge, Bobby, and I are uh, kept out of circulation for a while. Uh, one good thing, we, we have laid down a program, and it's not like taking uh, a uh, leaders uh, off of the, um, uh, the leaders uh, from the party and therefore taking the program or taking the uh, philosophy away that uh, it was our, uh, one of our um, <coughs> major uh, um, one of the major things we attempted to do was to to create a program so that the community could follow and uh, so we hope that other people uh, who have uh, leadership abilities will uh, will uh, be attracted to the program and to the community and go on with the liberation struggle so you you then definitely feel that the uh the philosophy behind the Black Panthers wouldn't change at all. It would simply be carried on. Yeah. Uh, yes, in our paper, uh, we have a very good uh, deputy uh, minister of information, Raymond Lewis, uh, who's done a fine job on the paper along with Eldridge Cleaver. So uh, Eldridge has already groomed a, uh, an editor, and I'm from the paper, I've read the paper, he's been doing a fine job. So uh, I think things will go on.
until I return. Do you do you have any feeling that there may be people involved in the Panthers who, as as the three of you are locked up, will get that much more frustrated? It seems to me to be an inevitable part of the whole process. Uh, do you expect an increasing sense of militancy in the Panthers at this time? Of this if, if this sort of thing continues to happen. I think that as the people of the world become more oppressed and uh, as the political repression uh, escalates in this country, that uh, the people are going to be led to, uh, to rebellion and then revolution. So I think this is a necessary stage that uh, the Liberation Front is going through, uh, just as they're uh, escalating the uh, the uh, oppression in Vietnam, the more, uh, uh, the higher the morale of the Vietnamese people are. And this is just one example of, uh, of an oppressed people fighting uh, for a long period of time under uh, very uh, adverse circumstances. I think it will be no different here. Is there anything in particular you'd like to uh, talk about that I haven't uh, touched on? Um, I'm always very lost when people ask me that question because there's a lot of, a uh, whole abundance of things that I can talk about. Well, choose what I'm saying. I was going to ask you about the, the prospect of, um, at least you're being in prison, uh, talking to inmates uh, and doing a degree of organizing of people who are going to be coming out all the time. Some people perhaps have been in since before the Panthers formed and with the censorship couldn't, could never have seen the Panther mm -hmm. papers anyway. Uh, and most of those things, uh, potential Panthers uh, in the prison system itself. So that you're being locked up doesn't necessarily stop organizing. Um, I'll be honest with you, I haven't made an effort to organize uh, so far because as I said, I was uh, becoming uh, familiar with uh, the procedure here and also with the inmates, but uh, inmates uh, have uh, joined the Panther. Uh, so far about 10 inmates have uh, approached me and uh, even though I haven't solicited any, uh, any uh, members, uh, they've approached me and asked if they could join the Panther and uh, some of them are on their way to other institutions and they want materials which I don't have, so I'm writing out some things for them. Um, so that they could take with them and study and, uh, and cooperate into their thinking. Um, I was thinking that would be a natural process in, in, um, in a movement spreading, especially among, among certain parts of the population most oppressed by ending up in, this, in these prisons. I'm sure it must be like Alameda County Jail in terms of the number of black prisons. Have you, what, what is the percentage, or have you been able to figure out at all the black, black to white ratio? Um, there's a larger percentage of blacks, maybe, maybe about 60, 70 percent black, roughly. This is strictly from observation, of maybe 20, 20 percent off or so. I don't know, but uh, there, uh, there's a large amount of uh, blacks here. But as I said, that I haven't uh, solicited, and but some inmates have joined up and asked, you know, for directions. It's kind of difficult because um, I am focused on at this point, and uh, um, the inmates themselves have cautioned me to be very careful because of uh, what we call the dead brothers who were. Who were uh, snitches or rats, and uh, um, many of them who joined up have cautioned me to be very careful about uh, what I say and uh, uh, what people I talk to. So um, I'm still sort of feeling myself around the, the place, but uh, I plan to do some more. W one of the things that I would really like to start is a, is a campaign. About half the guys here are, <coughs> are here on the uh, straight violations, as it's called. Uh, they don't have a new charge against them, so they didn't, they moved or something without notifying a parole officer, 
they come back here, or maybe do a couple more years, and they get their time refixed. It's called the Adult Authority. When they left on parole, uh, fixed their time in California's in indeterminate sentence, say five to life, and when they're being paroled, the Adult Authority then will fix their time, say at eight years, and uh, then they'll, they'll be discharged after the eight years, but they'll be out on parole, say three years, while they're out, they might move, and then they'll get violated, they'll come back here, then their time is refixed at the maximum, which is life, five to life, and they start the whole process over again. So this uh, seems uh, that it would be double jeopardy. Uh, the courts don't fix the time, and if the courts were to sentence you to a specific number of years, when they used to sentence you to a specific number of years, this was your time, and they could later on refix it and say that, uh, well, we're going to give you uh, more time after this. But the adult authority doesn't follow this, and uh, so far the courts have somewhat held them, uh, um, stood with the adult authority. I've been thinking of organizing a movement, which would be a path of project, of putting some attorneys together on the outside, say about 10 are willing to contribute some time, and uh, maybe they could get a post office box and uh, for contributions to, you know, give them some financial aid and uh, research this and uh, interview some of the inmates. Uh, many of them told me, have told me that they're interested in it and, um, and uh, challenge this particular uh, law of refixing time. And um, matter of fact, the inmates are very enthusiastic about it. I've talked to a number of them because they've asked me about Elder's case. So they're uh, very interested on that point. And this is the kind of project that uh, I would like to start. As far as any resistance in the jail, which I am an activist, but uh, I've never seen any point in uh, really uh, organizing a physical resistance in jail. I never have, because you always lose. It is difficult to imagine winning. After the conversation between Huey Newton and Joe Blum and Karen Wald and myself was over, getting out of Vacaville required more identification, more signatures, more sliding steel gates, and this time a challenge from one guard who wanted to know why I had no pass. I said I was with the press, and he said laughing in a friendly way, all the more reason to check. I smiled. The last gate clanged behind me. They checked my wrist under ultraviolet light for the half-moon stamp there, and I walked out into the parking lot, full of sunshine and the smell of onions rotting in the sun in nearby fields. This is Denny Smithson of KPFA's Public Affairs Department.